vermilion glass or air billows like clouds or desert storms, enclosing nothing. For in this room things are either empty or are waiting to acquire significance. <clears throat> That's a quotation from an essay by Stuart Morgan for an exhibition called Rites of Passage that was, uh, took place in 1995. And he's actually describing a piece of work, um, one of the cells by Louise Bourgeois. And um, that's relevant to my discussion today because the idea of objects waiting to acquire significance, you know, how do they acquire significance? That's one of the um, questions that I'm always asking myself in my own practice. You know, what, what is meaning? How do people bring meaning to the object? So I'm really happy to begin this series of performance lectures and um, I'm really uncertain what a performance lecture is so I'm really going to have to make it up as I go along. Mm -hmm. um, but having looked into it, I discovered that historically the performance lecture is characterised by the intention to blur the boundaries separating art from a discourse about art. In addition, the performance lecture can try to break down the boundaries between art and life. I need to remind myself frequently that the word art is derived from artifice, a falsehood that illuminates the experience of life that an individual senses, thinks, feels and lives. With this in mind, my lecture examines my work and proposes that a dialogue between maker and object and viewer and object emerges through the process of forming ideas and emotions into objects. In my practice, this is often a material, physical process where wood, paint, um, sometimes digital elements might combine in one work. The process of splitting, cutting, sawing, chiselling, gluing and painting are important, as well as making um, horrible noises. Um, as, are as important as, as the materials themselves, which are frequently difficult to shape. Now I can quickly tell you that the object does not say it all, but my objects fulfil a need, for me anyway, they give me meaning through a dialogue, and this dialogue is intertextual. So my purpose today is really to, to try to define what intertextuality is and where the word comes from and what ideas surround its history and what, what it might actually mean for me. So rather than uh, just uh, telling you what uh, the definition is, I'm actually going to show you as well um, through my own practice um, uh, later on. So there's, there's sort of, I've got two strategies. <coughs> the objects that I made reveal to me something about myself that can't be articulated in any other way. They look back at me and say, look at who you are. And of course, they're also saying that to other people. Um, I'm absent and the object is actually in an exchange, um, a relationship with uh, the spectator. Another confession. My reality is problematic. I don't really understand reality. My objects are both witnesses to and evidence of this misunderstanding. I'm interested in articulating the scale and quality of my misunderstanding through the objects I make. So um, I'm going to move quite soon to the discussion of Julia Kristeva's um, word, uh, intertextuality. Um, So I think I'll actually just move quickly to that now. So what is the text or object I'm, I make saying and doing? What need does it, the object fulfil for me? What is the purpose of me making my work? Uh, Christopher's use of the term intertextuality proposes that a text, that's any text, that, and, in, and in my case I'm talking about art, art objects as texts, um, have multi multiplying meanings present within them. 
there isn't just one meaning, there isn't a sort of classical notion of significance actually being terminated at, at a particular description at all. So, just to remind myself and to remind everybody actually <laughs> that I need to apply the theory to the interpretation of art objects in my own practice. So that's, I need to flag that up, that's really what I'm interested in doing is animating these concepts in order to understand my own practice better and how I might interpret it. So I mentioned earlier that the word intertextuality is very freighted and it comes from uh, a mid 20th century environment in the 1960s where um, the, I suppose you could call it, the, the, the continental philosophers and thinkers were really very, very active. So any student who's going to study Chris Daver needs to have some sort of grounding in the ideas that surround that and the history that precedes it. Um, so actually quite a, an intense and uh, problematic and challenging journey to come to grips with all of the ideas that these um, thinkers have, have brought about. <coughs> so. The idea of a signifying process is, it suggests that there's something always, a process that is always happening. Significance is always occurring, it's, it's, it's mutable, it's, it's changeable. And Kristeva combined her interest in um, language and semiotics with psychoanalysis. And her theory, especially in her doctoral thesis, um, is, is, is a fusion of those two um, ideas. So, just to go into a few more ideas, the, the semiotic um, that Kristeva articulates is associated with signifying practices, the movements of signifying practices. And in particular, um, Chris Daver articulates this process, the discharge of drives through the maternal body. So this is actually a, a, a feminist um, uh, proposal which relocates the Freudian notion of drives within a, within a, a, a feminine um, environment, or the genesis of them being from the womb, somehow to do with something quite early and primitive, primal. And the, the, the rhythms of the body which the um, child's prenatal child senses are then carried forward into life and they elaborate how we understand life. <coughs> This is a piece of work from 2013. It is a sort of chamber of, of sorts, which um, I thought I'd show you. So to, to think about more about the idea of intertextuality, a subject, that is the individual, is an absorption and transformation of a text. A text object is a signifying practice. It's the generation of texts and it's the relationship between texts as well. A text is a process that proposes a subject and Kristeva comes up with another term later on which is the subject as process. And I'm particularly interested in the idea of the subject being very unstable and really paradoxical because I, I can say this is me, I'm here. But when I start to really consider well who am I, what do I mean, well, how do I understand the various components of my individuality, then I realise, no, I am not, I'm not really quite certain about all of the sort of coordinates that I'm referencing. So um, if you think about individuality or subjectivity as being a process rather than a sort of static um, given, I think then um, Kristeva's notion of the subject as process is, is really uh, relevant, but also it has a de direct relationship to artistic practice because, of course, you're involved in a, a process of making. 
and doesn't that infer that you're actually making your own subjectivity through those objects, as, as I've already suggested. I'm, I'm visiting my subjectivity, my individuality, through the process of making. So, Chris Davis starts by, in her, in her book, uh, Revolution in Poetic Language, she's, which was published in, in French in the late 1960s, um, and actually only published in a translation in English in, in the 1980s. She identifies a period of rupture from the early 20th century that is present in texts by Joyce, Kafka, Arto, and Mallarmé. And it's this sort of breakup of the idea of a, of a classical subject that is somehow um, very, very stable. And um, the notion of the split subject, of course, is also articulated through um, Freud's psychoanalytical, psychoanalytical theory, where you have this unconscious, which is like a seething mass of fears and emotions and drives, which is somehow covered over by the ego, um, which is trying to control it. That, that is very much a, a, a notion of a split or divided subject. So I'm particularly interested in this quotation because drives are material. That is, the, the drives are not just um, somehow not material. There's an object to the drive. There's a, a, a drive is towards a desire. It has an object. But also, I like the idea of the drives being material because then it actually helps me to understand, well, then that means that the objects I'm making are the consequence of drives. They're the material manifestation of drives. But it's, it's suggested here the, the drives are actually to do... It's a rep repetition of some scission or, or partition or breakage or a split. Um, that's actually located at the point where the subject can't become resolved. You know, so I don't understand my reality. I actually want to try to. So there's a, a pro, an ongoing process of trying to think I have and then starting again. A bit like a frog trying to climb up the walls of a well and slithering down again. <coughs> so this idea of the physical side of the uh, uh, drives, which are, that is the reference to the somatic here, rather than the psychical, that's very much part of the sort of Freudian parcel, is that it's not just the, the mind that's working, but it's actually the way that the, the mind and the body are integrated and the drives are manifested through or via both, especially via the body anyway. So, as I mentioned, if drives are material, then art objects are attributes of drives. So I need to note here that I'm actually applying Freudian psychoanalytical theory via Kristeva to come up with this proposal. So I, I need to sort of say, well, hang on, maybe I don't agree with that, or maybe it's just a sort of load of theories that I've cobbled together, you know, that, that I'm, I'm not absolutely convinced, but I think that there's something productive about examining these relationships between drive, the materiality of drives and the production of art and the function that art has in somehow manifesting qualities of what those drives are. So I've come up with a, a sort of temporary uh, scheme where the, the, the articulating some of Chris Daver's, um principal ideas here around the idea of the material body, the materiality of drives, the maternal body and matter. And here there's a, a deliberate play with the actual language because um, the material and maternal, they're actually quite similar. They're, um, I'm not sure about the etymology, but there's something, something that's sort of there's a slippage between the two. So the signifying practice is the um, struggle to try to reach an understanding, to, to use signs to understand. But that's constantly broken. 
So then, this is a, a sort of temporary or proposal, really. The text or object or intertext is the result, and then the whole thing starts again. So, um, how long have I just spent doing that? <coughs> Got another 10, 15 minutes, you're about halfway through to half an hour. Okay. I hope that, that's, I hope that didn't seem too long. That was quite intense, actually. Um, that, that it's really intense uh, ideas. You know, I, write, I really like the idea of sort of coming to grips with them, trying to grasp them and understand them. So now I'm going to change tactic and uh, just show you a piece of video here. Uh, it's all working, it should be all working. question is well actually how does that relate to what I've just said and what is that what is the the sort of what is that I've, that, that I've just shown you it's a piece of work that I produced in 2013 for the old lookout gallery in um, Broadstairs and actually I wanted to visit this, uh, this coconut shy uh, design but actually uh, make it like a chamber of horrors sort of co combine the two but I, I also thought, well, there's this sort of idea of decapitation, of, of, of throwing balls at heads, it's actually quite violent and, and unpleasant. And so for me, there's something quite fundamentally uh, um, aggressive about that action that I wanted to examine. That, so the relationship between something that, that was funny and aggressive being combined it was um, particularly interesting. And I think... Um, the younger visitors to the uh, gallery enjoyed it particularly and they wanted to take it home and set it up in their, in their um, bedrooms. So um, let me now move to uh, another film and I'll just start to play this because the sound's not very loud. I felt I can turn the sound off. Now, before I start, um, that a lot of the, my work actually ends up in my house, you know, it's actually there. It's just, just it's a sort of domestic setting that that's, that's that's where it is, and so actually having described this process of making things that then reflect back to me who I am, I'm actually living amongst these articulations of my own personality, and the, 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 that's actually quite important. Um, I wish somebody would actually come and take them all away and pay me loads of money for them, but that, that hasn't happened yet. So, so, so um, having said that, it's actually really special. You know, there's something special about the way that I can relate to these things. So that, uh, and I don't want them to go away. You know, I would actually feel that there was, there was something wrong about them all being taken away too. I feel sort of, sort of bereft. And quite often, artists do feel a bit depressed after they have an exhibition or or um, put something on because you know they've just done all this work and then they say, "Is that it?" So I think there's something about the creative process and the cycle that, that, that's quite important to try to get to come to terms with. So, um, let's just watch what happens here. The, um, I've concentrated in recent years, especially with the, the experimenting with the uh, shape uh, or the, the, the potential of the human head. So in, in actually each of these 
little heads is a little articulation or representation of, of me.